Manhattan Neighborhood Network, in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York, the New York Amsterdam News, and Gotham Gazette, is pleased to welcome you to a debate between three candidates running for public advocate in New York's general election. I'm Ben Max, executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The Public Advocate Office was created in 1993 to be a check on the mayor and the city council and the rest of city government. It is the second highest ranking elected official in the city. The Public Advocate is a non-voting member of the city council with the right to introduce and co-sponsor legislation. The Public Advocate investigates citizen complaints and serves as a watchdog over city government. The Public Advocate provides oversight for city agencies and makes proposals to address deficiencies and failures of those agencies. The office is meant to be a tireless voice for New Yorkers. And the candidates joining us for this debate are J.C. Polanco, the Republican Reform and Stop de Blasio candidate, Devin Balkand, the Libertarian Party candidate, and James Lane, the Green Party candidate. So thank you all for being here. Let's get started with you, Mr. Lane. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're running for public advocate. Well, yes, my name is James Lane. I'm the Green Party candidate for public advocate, and I've been a lifelong resident of New York City. And what I've seen is that the city has just become a place where it's actually more beneficial for tourists than it is for the people that live and work here. And I'm running to help make the lives of everybody um, in the city better. You know, issues with affordable housing is a big issue for me. Uh, the, the crime the injustice system that we have around the city is a big issue. And also the most important thing for me is transforming our, our current electoral processes because they're old, antiquated, and they really don't serve the, the public the way it should. Tell us a little bit about your background. What brings you to this race? Well, basically, I mean, my background is I have uh, three decades of experience managing teams and people, departments and such. Uh, what brought me to this race in 2013, because I ran for public advocate then as well, uh, was the fact that I found my mother uh, after many years of searching. Uh, and the first thing she told me was that um, she gave me up for adoption. And she said she prayed for 48 years that she would see me again uh, before she died. And so that was actually the thing that pushed me out from the shadows of, of helping other people with their campaigns and other activist movements into like, hey, you know, this is an issue that we need to bring to you know, the public eye because people don't know in New York State adoptees like me don't have access to see original birth certificates. But along with that, you know, that's, so that's my personal issue. But of course, all the other issues that I've been marching for and against uh, around the city is the reason why I figured let's use this opportunity to bring all these issues up to the political arena. And you're running uh, as a Green Party candidate, and we'll come back to you in a minute to describe a little bit about what that means and how that informs your campaign and your platform. Uh, Mr. Balkan, tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're running for public advocate. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Um, my name is Devin Balkind. I'm running on the Libertarian line. Uh, and I'm really excited about the opportunity that we have to use technology to drastically open up uh, our city's government and the amount of efficiencies, the amount of cost savings, the improved services that are possible if we use open source methodologies that are emerging in the, in the software industry and are emerging around the world as, as a better way to get things done within government. And I think the public advocate with its role as being an information manager uh, has the perfect opportunity to be kind of the tip of the spear bringing this open source methodology uh, to city agencies. And so I work in uh, the field of disaster management. I've seen how older kind of industrial hierarchical systems of organizational uh, management uh, are failing in, in to, to provide people with the services that they expect. And I see the same trends taking place in city government. And I've seen how the open source movement and these new technologies, these flexible technologies that empower people can just make things work so much better and make people into producers of a better government instead of just consumers of the existing government. Be just a little bit more specific about what you do, your work? So I, I, I'm the president of an organization that produces information management systems, resource management systems for uh, agencies and organizations that manage disasters. So floods, hurricanes, things like that. Our systems are used in a variety of cities in the U.S. and they're mostly used uh, in, in Asia and South Asia to help large organizations uh, manage uh, a disaster, basically solve people's problems during a disaster. Great, thank you. And, and as you said, you're running on the Libertarian Party line, and we want to hear a little bit more about what that means. Uh, Mr. Polanco, uh, who are you? What brings you to this race? And uh, why do you want to be public advocate? Well, thank you for this opportunity. I want to thank our sponsors for having us this morning to talk about the issues. Um, I'm very excited about this race. I've prepared myself relentlessly to ask the voters of New York City for the opportunity to be their public advocate. 
I'm running for public advocate because I really think this position is very special um, to change the lives of millions of families across our city. You know, uh, it's the position that is our, our bastion against corruption. It is the position that is the incubator of ideas. It's the position that is designed by its very creation to be the visionary to get things done for our families. And I'm running because I think that the office has been underutilized and has been diluted from funding and power for so long. So I want to make sure that New Yorkers know that this office exists. And the way that we're going to do that is by bringing certain questions to New Yorkers, whether or not this office should be revamped. Should this office have the same funding as the city controller's office? Should this office have direct supervision over ACS uh, and the Department of Homeless Services, two key agencies that under this mayor's leadership we have seen complete, disa uh, uh, complete disasters with children being abused and dying under their watch. And we've seen the homelessness crisis skyrocket. So why not take these two agencies and give it to the public advocate and say, you're in charge? I think it's also very important for us to take a look at how we could convert NYCHA housing into individually owned housing. And that will give thousands of families that ha are in NYCHA housing the opportunity to experience the American dream. Now, I know that is a stretch of an idea, but as I mentioned a little earlier, the public advocate is supposed to be the incubator of ideas. And I think that we can develop a plan, working with the controller's office, and checking out the Constitution and seeing how we can go from public to private in many of our NYCHA system, uh, uh, NYCHA housing, because not only are there many families stuck in those apartments for generations without the opportunity of home ownership, but many of them are food deserts, where there aren't many bodegas or delis anywhere near the area because they can't get there. So as a public advocate, I want to address those issues. Now, my background is interesting, if I may, Ben. Um, just uh, a few seconds. Yeah. I, I apologize if I spoke to him. I'm just very excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Um, I've been a, an educator for almost two decades. I've taught at the secondary school level at Truman High School in the Bronx, at Boricua College, and now for the last decade, I've taught history, economics, and law at the Borough of Manhattan Community College. Uh, I'm the New York City Director for the State Assembly Minority, and I'm an attorney with a private practice. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I'm going to mix up who speaks first, but this time we'll start again in the same order. Uh, Mr. Lane, tell us what it means to be a Green Party candidate and how that sort of affects your platform and, and some of the highlights of what you want to do as public advocate. Yeah, well, definitely why I am a Green Party member and, and a Green Party candidate is because the Green Party is based on four pillars, basically for grassroots democracy, nonviolence, social justice, and ecological wisdom. So we feel that those are the building blocks for like a, a, creating a society that is just and fair and healthy. I mean, right now we're seeing around the city, like, you know, JC was mentioning, you know, we have homelessness at the highest rate ever. And our current mayor is talking about, oh, well, we need more affordable housing. And it's like, well, then who's responsible for that? You know, I mean, the mayor can actually, or and even the public advocate, can actually look around and say, look, we need to have a moratorium on these high rises that are going up. Uh, maybe shift the 80-20 rule around to like 50-50 until we get to a place where we have more affordable housing units. And so that way people don't have to work as hard as they're doing right now to just have a place to live. And there's so many people that are working like two or three jobs now and they can't have a place to live. They're living in homeless shelters. So these, these are the, the kind of quality of life things that I'm you know, interested in, not the things that the mayor is interested in because his quality of life things usually send people to jail. Thank you. Mr. Balkan, uh, Libertarian Party, what does that mean? How does that affect your, your platform? Absolutely. Uh, the Libertarian Party is the third largest party in the country. It's, tw it's twice the size of the Green Party. It's 20 plus times the size of uh, the DSA, Democratic Socialists. Uh, and I think it's an, it, the Libertarian Party has been underperforming in our nation's big cities. It's been underperforming in, in New York City. And so one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the Libertarian Party uh, and I'm running as a Libertarian is because I think there's an amazing opportunity to use a Libertarian Party in New York City to become a, a party of innovation, a kind of a party that respects uh, the, the technical innovations that are taking place in the private sector and applying them to the public sector. And one of the things I want to bring up is that a lot of the media uh, describes technology as kind of a for-profit enterprise with startup CEOs on the cover of Success Magazine. Uh, and there's another story in technology, and, there's, and that's the story of open source. That's the story of people working together to build information commons that enrich everyone's lives. That's the story of Linux. It's the story of WordPress. It's the story of Wikipedia. And so I want to bring that methodology to city government. I want to bring that methodology to, to the public because the public doesn't know enough about it. And I think that the Libertarian Party is an amazing platform to do it. So uh, I want to hear more about some of those ideas, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But 
Uh, libertarians typically favor sort of less government, have a lot of privacy concerns. It sounds like some of your platform is a little different than that. I have a lot of privacy concerns, and I think that our ability over the next four years to navigate uh, the privacy concerns that technology is raising is critically, critically important. We're on the verge of a massive technical shift, and so that's really important. When it comes to less government, what I'm proposing is, is something called big city libertarianism, and what that basically says is that the federal government has proven that it is not the best manager of our money, and that what we need to do is we need to bring, we need to structure our society so that local communities, and particularly in big cities, have more control, more sovereignty, and more, and keep more of the money locally so that we can deploy the resources that we need to make the lifestyles that we want uh, available. And so I think that when we just say government, we just say, use the blanket term government, what we're not acknowledging is that there's a federal government, there's state governments, and there's, there's municipal governments and counties, but also there's a bioregionalism that's becoming possible, that's becoming po uh, popular in Europe and in other places, and that we need to start thinking beyond the existing borders that we have and think about what would a regional government for the New York metropolitan area be? Okay, because I'm going I'm to stop you there, but thank you. So, Mr. Polanco, we didn't mention you're running on the Republican Party line, the Reform Party line, and a new line created called Stop de Blasio, which I think... <laughs> We get the picture of, um, <laughs> but tell us a little bit about sort of your political philosophy and sort of generally speaking what your agenda is all about here. You know, um, the question as to why, why am I a Republican, I grew up in the Bronx in the 80s and um, it was a very tough time in the Bronx where almost every weekend in every one of uh, the corners in, uh, in within a five block radius, we would have these temporary cardboard murals dedicated to just another one of our young kids and neighbors and friends of mine that had been lost to the drug war, um, and it really took a toll on me. I, I often blame the bad guys for stealing my, my youth. And I remember very clearly being in disgust of some of the policies that I saw that allowed for these bad guys to be around. Now, in the Bronx, as you know, Ben, um, you register Democrat because if not, you don't have a voice because all of the elections are done in September. So as an 18-year-old, I registered Democrat, but I always had a conservative-minded idea as to law and order and social mobility and economic opportunity. And the, the call that Ronald Reagan uh, discussed when I was a little boy really resonated with me that when I turned 21, I became a, a Republican because I really felt that that was the party that best viewed, that best suited my views on issues. And I saw what Mayor Giuliani was able to do in New York City, and I saw the reduction in crime, and I saw how people started to live again, and, <laughs> and we no longer had to die again because of policies that I saw a Republican implement. That all affected me a great deal. So I became a Republican, and I'm running on a platform that calls for um, an understanding of law and order with respect to community. I'm calling for economic opportunity and social mobility. And I'm calling for a return to the days when Republicans were practical, pragmatic, and were common sense Republicans. And I think that throughout my campaign, I have demonstrated a, a level-headed New York City first Republicanism that I think will resonate with voters across the city. Thank you. So I'm gonna start this round with you, Mr. Balkan. Uh, and we're looking here for what are some of your big ideas? Some of you have touched on these already, but the Public Advocate Office, and, and before we, we talk about this, you know, I should mention uh, you're three of the four candidates who will be on the ballot. The incumbent, Democrat Letitia James, uh, declined the invitation to, to join us today, but you're the other three candidates who will be on the ballot uh, trying to unseat uh, Ms. James as she seeks a second term here. So the Public Advocate's Office is a, is a bit amorphous. There's a lot of flexibility. You've also touched on that a little bit. So what are some of your big ideas? What do you want voters to hear a couple weeks before Election Day that can sort of excite them? Mr. Balkan? Absolutely. I think that the city charter is relatively clear about the public advocate's role being a role of information management. One of the great assets, one of the great powers of the public advocate is to chair the Commission on Public Information and Communication. And this is a role that hasn't really been engaged in by the current public advocate. Uh, you know, there are very few meetings. And, and what that commission's supposed to do is organize the city's information so that the public understands what is going on. And so, yeah, as a, as a kid, I played a video game called SimCity uh, quite frequently, and I really enjoyed that game because what you do is you take all of this information about a city, that, this, this virtual city, and you make decisions as if you're the mayor of that city. And then you get to see those decisions play out. And so what we have right now is an opportunity 
be, thankfully, because we've had an open data law on the books for over five years now, where we have a tremendous amount of information that the city's producing, over the next few years we're going to see even more of that information become available because agencies have to comply with this open data law. And so we have an amazing opportunity to create interfaces, video game style interfaces, that, show the, that give the public unbelievable understanding of what's taking place in the city, where the services are, what, where the services could be, uh, what, you know, po how population is shifting. And so when, if we can en enrich the public's understanding of how the city's working, then we can give the public an amazing opportunity to make better decisions about what it is they want to see public officials do. Mr. Polanco, you mentioned the idea of uh, possibly allowing some NYCHA residents to own their units eventually. Yes. Uh, maybe you want to either expand on that, but maybe give us some other of your big ideas that you're running on. Sure, th that one is very important because throughout my years as an educator, thousands of my students have lived in housing and so have their parents and their grandparents. They realize they'll never have the American dream of home ownership. Why not recognize that it's no longer temporary and let's work together to see how some who qualify can get those low interest mortgages and we'll work on that together with the controller's office. But as the former president and commissioner at the New York City Board of Elections, I had the opportunity to, ma to help manage a budget of over $100 million and over 36,000 employees at the board. And I have a very good idea as to one of the things that are needed to really encourage people to come out and vote. I put forth a proposal to change the election systems in New York City so that we can get more people to vote. And that included an early voting program so that New York can catch up to the 21st century and join other states that allow for voters to come out and vote early on. This would be a process where they will vote one week beforehand. I think that will do two things. First, we will get... Uh, a turnout that is much higher than what we see now that is normally in the high teens or the low 20s. I want to see at least 60, 70 percent of New Yorkers come out and vote. Recognizing that we are going to be able to reduce the lines on election day by alleviating that, by opening up our poll sites a week in advance uh, at the Board of Elections, I think we'll get a lot more people to come out and vote. And I've also called for nonpartisan elections so that the 17 percent of New York City that's not registered in any party can finally have a say in elections. Because right now, most of our elections, over 98 percent of them, are decided in September in a closed primary system. So if you're a New York City voter watching today, I'm the candidate that's talking about opening up the process to allow for you to have a say. So there are many issues that I'm really uh, focusing on, including... So in an open primary system, sure, sure. anybody can vote no matter what party they're registered in. They can choose which primary they might want to vote an, for. In an open primary system, the, uh, there's two ways that they can function. One is that regardless of what party you're in, you can go and vote. The reason why that's so controversial is if I'm a Republican, I will vote for the, uh, the, the less qualified Democratic candidates so we can win in November. That's the argument against it. So I call for nonpartisan elections and allow everybody to come in and vote. That way you vote your best interest and there's no sinister plot to vote against another party. And I think we can get support across the city because the city is becoming increasingly nonpartisan or blank or independent yeah, voters. Yeah, it's very interesting. A lot of people leave that out. In New York City, the enrollment is largely Democratic, but the second biggest group is actually unaffiliated, people registered but who, who don't so, choose a party. So represent those people, Ben, and I think I have a good plan to get them to vote. Thank you. Mr. Lane, some, some ideas that you want folks to hear. Maybe you want to talk a little bit more about what you were saying about affordable housing, but up to you. Well, yeah, <laughs> so actually I would like to start off because, honestly, unless we change our electoral process in the city and get people elected that actually represent the communities that, that it's serving, we're not going to really have progress in the city. So one of the things I want to do is transform our electoral process. Like you mentioned before, having open primaries are great. I have concerns about it because you said you can sort of vote for this person to get the worst person in uh, to get this person elected. I'm actually more of a fan of ranked choice voting. That's what uh, when I was running in 2013 in the, in the public advocate race, they had like, so many Democratic candidates. They didn't have a clear winner. Letitia James had to go against Daniel Squadron, and yet another special election that cost the city $13 million just to have. A runoff. Yeah. Right, a runoff. Even though Letitia James was already on the ballot as a Work and Families car, uh, Party candidate in the November election. And so I'd send out a press release and say, hey, Tish, be a true public advocate and say, look, I don't want to cost the city $13 million. I'll continue to run as a Work and Families candidate, let Daniel Squadron run, and let my other competitors run. That's what I would have done. But, you know, maybe I'm a special kind of person. So what I feel is ranked choice voting is actually more democratic than having an open primary because people are allowed to pick, you know, I like this candidate first, like this candidate second, and so on. And I'm actually more of a fan of a weighted ranked choice. So your first uh, choice would have a higher weight than your second choice. And that just real quick on your uh, affordable housing point from earlier, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, you mentioned possibly put a moratorium on big market rate or largely market rate developments. Do you think that would not sort of stifle 
growth in the city. And the argument against that also is that uh, we just need a lot more supply, period, to sort of let some of the air out of the, the balloon here. Right. Well, you know, honestly, <laughs> what I've seen is that, you know, this, this growth that people are talking about in the city is coming from outside the city. You know, all the, these, these residential units that are being built are being bought by, you know, outside investors, you know, just as a way to profit because now that we have this big tourist market, it's great. You know, they're, they're renting it out for, for you know, short-term stays and whatever. There's no real uh, evaluation or, or monitoring of these properties or these units. So why I call for a moratorium on new developments is because we could, one, as we talked about, looking at the data, looking at how many units do we need, how many units are, are currently uh, derelict. There's a lot of derelict properties around the city that landlords are just holding, waiting for their, their market value to go up and get the best price. That shouldn't be allowed. In New York City, I mean, I'm calling for like a home rule in New York City for a lot of changes like this. So if we see a property that's been on, you know, derelict for X number of months or maybe a year, you know, the city should be able to come in and negotiate with the landlord, take that property back, uh, own that, the renter will pay the city back, and then after a certain amount of time, the city will give that owner, the renter, the first choice to buy it. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Polanco, we'll start with you this time. The current public advocate, uh, again, you know, with the office being a little bit of what you want to make of it, uh, the current public advocate has moved the office, has hired more lawyers and moved the office a bit towards um, what she likes to refer to as sort of a people's law firm, uh, introducing a lot more legislation, which she's been fairly successful with, filing a lot of lawsuits against the city, which have been a, a mixed bag. But, but that's how she's sort of chosen to organize the office. What I'd like to hear from all of you, Mr. Polanco, first is how would you structure the office and how would you also then use it to make sure that you're hearing from constituents, which is a key part of the public advocate job? You know, it, that's an interesting question. I think that using the office as a law firm uh, is not the right idea simply because the office lacks standing as is, which is one of the first things I said this, this morning is we need to have a referendum to give the office standing in state courts so it has some teeth to free these lawsuits. But I think I would operate it a little differently, understanding that I'm calling for public education campaigns to galvanize the city, to believe in an important cause. I think I would work on bringing in uh, people that are very familiar with public education campaigns. You know, we are always going to have the social workers and the attorneys working in the public advocate's office. But we need people that are, have smarts in government relations because a lot of the work that I want to do ha it involves negotiating with Albany on legislation, on getting referendums on the ballot, and working on charter revision commissions. So I'm going to be working very closely within the inside, people that understand the charter, the state constitution, and are, and are very familiar with bill drafting because I'm going to be very much involved in changing the office from the inside out. So that's going to be my focus. Now, obviously, uh, in, a, in a previous discussion with the public advocate, there was a lot of discussion as to constituent work. Well, you don't get credit for things you're supposed to do. There was a number of 30,000 things that you're supposed to do. You know, I grade papers and correct finals. You know, I don't want credit for that. I'm supposed to do it. So I think the public advocate's office, in its ver by its very nature, is supposed to provide constituent services when people need help with agencies that aren't providing the services necessary. Public advocate should be there as well. But I also want to do one more thing. I want to look at New York City a little differently. I want to open up the market a little more. I think there's a little too much uh, regulation of systems, and whether it's in housing or in business. I think if we were to take a different approach, not end all regulation, because that would be absurd. But when we look at housing and, and look at the 80-20 requirement and look at the kind of revenues that we're no longer getting in New York City because we want to give huge tax breaks to billionaire developers, I think we, we should take a look as to why are we doing that, hurting our schools by not collecting that revenue, to provide a pittance of apartment units for people that, as you mentioned, James, may not even be from the city. And lastly, I'm not going to lose the law firm angle of the office because I plan to write an amicus brief in favor of the Winfield v. New York City case which challenges the lottery system in affordable housing as being discriminatory and perpetuating a segregated city. So I want to work on those things as well. Thank you. Mr. Lane, how would you structure the office and how would you make sure that you are hearing from your constituents which, as public advocate is everybody in New York City? Well, yeah, and as we talked about before, the public advocate does have <laughs> control over that, that communication department. And right now, we've seen for the past four years, you know, you don't really get to hear from Tish James until it's time to run for election. I mean, I think her lawsuits actually didn't start until last year, you know, a year before she starts the campaign. Say, like, look, I have a lawsuit against this, a lawsuit against that. So from day one, you should already create a system that allows all the constituents in all the communities to actually interact with the public advocate office directly. 
what we're seeing right now is a lot of people don't even know that the office exists. That's a, a failure on, on the department itself. You know, the first thing you should do, I mean, whether it's through email or, or snail mail or phone calls or whatever, the public advocate should be reaching out to communities and letting people know, going into community centers. I mean, that's the whole thing. So we need to actually expand the offices beyond where it is right now in, in Manhattan to each borough. I mean, I would love to, one of the things I would love to do is actually work with the borough presidents in each borough and create a place in their offices for everyone to go to to interact with the public advocate office. So that would be the first thing I would do. So you can create that kind of information exchange of what is it that's actually affecting you? What is it uh, in, in certain departments, whether it's housing or health or, or public education or elected officials? You know, the, the current public advocate will not challenge an elected official on something that they've done horrible as far as if it's a city council candidate that's got large real estate donations and they're making votes along with that real estate person that's an obvious thing and the public advocate should investigate that as well as uh there's a couple of other issues i have was most sharply on the nypd um why don't we why don't we come back to that sure. in a little bit um I, you know, the, the current public advocate should be here to defend herself in her absence. I won't do too much of it. Yeah. I do think she did start to file those uh, lawsuits a little earlier than last year. And, you know, one thing that's very interesting about this office is, you know, we in the media and the city media get uh, her schedules every day. And she's speaking at civic associations and she's holding town halls all over the city. And it's still remarkable in the sort of public opinion polls. You still don't see that making that much of a dent. So it'd be very interesting to see how yet another public advocate to try to, to, try to lift that, that profile. Uh, Mr. Balkan. I've spoken to hundreds of New Yorkers you know, on the campaign trail, and I don't think anyone said to me, we need another lawyer as a politician in this office. Uh, we have almost all of our legislatures are lawyers. Uh, almost all of our current politicians are lawyers. What we need is an information manager who can take this tremendous amount of information that the city's producing and organize it so New Yorkers understand it. And so I wanna, I wanna get specific about that after I also say that, just go in, going into the kind of the electoral reform thing, um, you know, we've seen representative democracy, you know, playing out where people basically give their voice to politicians. But there's something new that's taking place. There's something called participatory democracy. There's something called public consultation processes that are emerging around the world as, as an alternative to and as an upgrade to uh, representative democracy. And what that looks like is having long con having extended conversations with the public about what it is they want to see happen and the way you do that and the way that's being practiced is basically using technology using interactive apps using live stream broadcasts using facilitated in-person events to bring people together to kind of discuss issues with them to group people who have similar ideas together so that they can so that they can work together to come up with proposals of what they want to see take place and then bring all those proposals together in a public forum uh, with experts and saying, okay, can we take this from this proposal, that from that proposal, bring it together and build consensus for what it is that we should be doing next as a city. And so I think that the public advocate's job, and I think this is quite supported by the charter, is to organize information so the public can make good decisions and then give the public a process, not a politics, not a political party, but a process where they can then say, we think this should happen. And then the public advocate becomes a voice for that. And it's not about the individual and about what the individual's opinion is, but it's about being a true conduit for the public. I want to I have a follow-up question, but I do want to say sort of for the record that most uh, in city government don't aren't attorneys. Uh, the mayor's not an attorney. The controller's not an attorney. A lot of city council members are not attorneys. But, Over 50%, um, though. I'm not sure about that. Well, but we'll, 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 um, we, we can fact check that later. Yeah. On your proposal here, there's a lot of people in New York City that still struggle to connect to the internet who are not technologi uh, technologically savvy. How does the work you just described get to those people? So th there's, there's two parts. One is that facilitated in-person events is an extremely important part of that. And, and so is uh, video broadcasts and regular communication. And so interactive apps isn't the only, uh, the only piece of the pie, it's just one piece of the pie. The other thing is that if you have Medicaid, you can get a free smartphone. From, from, from the city, from the government, period. And also we're watching, now we have free Wi-Fi coming in through uh, all these Link NYCs, and we're watching over the next four years, we're gonna see, uh, you know, right now over 80% of New Yorkers have smartphones that are connected to the internet, and over 95% of New Yorkers, I believe, over the age, of, or under the age of 40, have these devices connected to the internet. So this is a much more popular medium than television, than newspapers, than 
uh, radio. Like the, the the internet is here to stay, and right. it's going to be, and 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 and, it, and it's going to be even more so in the future. Thank you. So, Mr. Lane hit on this a little bit. Uh, one of the jobs that people look to the public advocate for is holding the mayoral administration accountable, maybe even the city council, but largely the mayoral administration uh, being a ch one check on that administration. How would you do that as public advocate? We're going to come back to you, Mr. Lane, to start. How would you do that as public advocate? And um, assuming, uh, although there's still an election to be taking place, it is Mayor de Blasio in a second term, you know, specifically about his administration, uh, if there's anything particular there that you want to uh, home in on. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the thing about Mayor de Blasio, it seems he either <laughs> goes into a think tank with a bunch of people and creates some kind of legislation or, or ideas that he thinks is great for the city. Like he'll come up with an $80 billion project to reform the city in some way. And then what will happen is the day after that, we have a press conference after press conference after press conference on City Hall about how this is not the best plan for the city. There's better ways to be using this money all around the city. So as public advocate, what I would need to do is actually engage in these groups that are already doing the work in the streets. A lot of these groups are actually in communities working on issues of affordable housing, working on issues of restorative justice and people that are being released from Rikers Island and, and trying to get them integrated back into society. Uh, as far as uh, feeding the homeless, you know, as far as finding, you know, shelters for homeless, you know, not creating more shelters, but finding some kind of, of uh, housing unit for them. You know, there, there's a lot of issues that if the mayor would just open his doors and work with the communities, and the community organizing groups, rather than trying to work against them, it could be so much better. And so as public advocate, I would have to do that job. I would definitely reach out to every, and actually I'll call out to everybody right now that's watching this. If you're a, a member of a group and, and is butting heads with the mayor and your city council, you know, reach out and say, hey, how can we work together to sort of create legislation to actually push through? And you will get the support of the city council, because that's the one thing people forget. Uh, the people actually are the ones that are creating the, the legislation. City council people are waiting for people to create it. A city council person and the mayor just sort of waits around and, you know, if they want to sort of lift their, their status, they'll create something and say, hey, this seems cool and exciting. But it's really the people in the community that need to get together and, and sort of force that hand and say, this is what we need in our communities. And as public advocate, I would make sure that they get all the resources they need to get that done. Thank you. Mr. Balkan, how, how would you hold the mayoral administration accountable? Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many opportunities, particularly when you start going into the, into the, the data, the data side of these things. I mean, I think that uh, the way, one great way to hold the mayor accountable is to hold the agencies accountable, and one great way to hold the agencies accountable, uh, because the mayor is, of course, overseeing all these agencies, uh, is to make their information publicly available, make it possible for the public to look through what's taking place in these agencies, and get really, and enable the public to crowdsource intelligence about where things can be improved. One, one of the roles of the public advocate is to be uh, collect, monitoring services and collecting complaints uh, from the public about, like, ab ab about the current administration. So this is something that could be done in a very transparent manner. This could be done in a way where you, you have a counter, you have a leaderboard. You see how many complaints are going up against each agency. How many agencies are solving these complaints? I mean, what we see with the 311 system is something uh, the public advocate could be maintaining kind of an alternative 311 insofar as collecting issues and comparing them to what, uh, comparing them to the budget, comparing them to agency uh, reports about, the, about their progress and things like that. I've so, always wondered if there's a way for the public advocate to sort of coincide with 311, but you're proposing sort of an alternative uh, network? Right now, the public advocate's collecting these issues. They're collecting, it's com collecting complaints. These complaints, these are issues that 311 is supposed to be managing issues for city services, right? So there, there is in the technology world something called Open 311. This is an open data standard for how 311 issues can be logged, which would allow us to do a tremendous amount of analysis around these issues, but also allow us to kind of access these issues, not just through the 311 app, but through any app that any developer wants to make. And so this is kind of what's been taking place with the MTA and how they do their scheduling and why you're allowed to see, you, you know, you can see MTA schedules in all of these different apps. We could do something similar with 311 data if we applied Open 311, and if we had the public advocate running its own issue tracking system and comparing that to 311 we could develop, we could get so many insights about that and that's only that's only one piece of the pie because that once you start getting into the budgets of all of these agencies and we start going into these agencies and figuring out 
who's working where, doing what, and really creating an inf a rich information environment, we're going to be able to get a lot of insights about how we can improve things. But we're not going to get those insights if we rely on proprietary consultants to kind of come up with reports for us. We're only going to get them if we open up this information and make it available to the public so that academics and journalists and, and anyone who's interested can look at it and make recommendations. Thank you. Mr. Polanco, holding the mayoral administration accountable. I think um, one of the first proposals I, I put out was a new New York City.gov website, NYC.gov, that would provide a sunshine into how we operate as a city. And I think that today, if you are a, a voter or a resident of New York City and you wanted to see who was fundraising for what candidate, for what council member, what lobbyist is representing what company, you're going to scavenger hunt looking for this information. I propose that we have a new website out of New York City.gov where you can actually go and see what lobbyist was visiting what member of the city government, if it's the mayor or one of his agencies, what was that meeting about, what project or what kind of money were, were, were they trying to seek? And then finally, this is an important one, how much money did that lobbyist pay or give in donations to that candidate or that mayor? And then finally, was that project successful? Once we provide all of that in one linear form so that voters can see whether or not there's pay to play going on. Because had, had, if, if we had that, we would have seen that this mayor did in fact participate in a nefarious pay to play scheme in City Hall. And although he may have escaped an indictment by the court of law, he did not escape an indictment in the, in the court of public opinion. And I think it has been clear that this public advocate has been silent on attacking this mayor, knocking that door down so that we actually see what's happening in City Hall, so that we can build trust with the city and their government. We should be able to make sure we know exactly how much money is being paid and if those projects are being successful. So one of the ways that I'm going to make sure the mayor is doing his job is to be completely independent of the mayor. Now, that's regardless if Bill de Blasio wins or if Nicole Maliotakis wins. The public advocate should be an independent source for voters and for the residents of New York City to assure that their government is doing right by them. And that's what I would do. Thank you. So we're a little past our midway point here, and I want to get into some specific issues that are clearly bubbling up uh, for New Yorkers or perpetual concerns, education, transit, homelessness. Uh, before we do that, since we're around the halfway point, I want to go to a bit of a, a quicker round, lightning round type of uh, round here and just get a yes or no with a very quick explanation. I'll move you along if, you, if you're not being quick enough on a variety of things. So uh, we're going to start with Mr. Polanco here and, and go this way, actually. Uh, will you be voting yes or no for a constitutional convention, the first question on the back of the ballot in November? Yes, absolutely. We need to have a constitutional convention to get rid of pay-to-play and fraud in state government and in city government. Mr. Balkan? Yes, and if we have good public consultation processes, I think that the public would be much more interested and much more confident in their ability to get a positive outcome for that. But absolutely, yes. Mr. Lane? Personally, I'll be voting no because I'm not 100% uh, happy about how the delegates are going to be chosen. I don't know enough about the electoral system that's going to be used to do this. So until there's more visibility on that process, I'm voting no. Thank you. Mr. Polanco, do you support uh, the general plan to close the Rikers Island jail complex? No, I oppose any plan to close Rikers and replacing them with neighborhood jails. Mr. Balkan? Absolutely, and um, we should put less people in jail. Mr. Lane? Right. I, I, Rikers needs to be closed. There's people there, Rikers, that aren't, aren't guilty of any crimes other than not being able to pay ba bail. I'm going to come back to you on this one. Uh, generally speaking, congestion pricing, are you in favor of adding uh, fees to sort of flooding the Manhattan Business District and, and clogging up Manhattan a bit more? And typically that would include adding tolls to the East River bridges, which are currently free. Are you a, a proponent or opponent of, of congestion pricing? Well, as a Green Party member, I'm in favor of it. I mean, personally, because of the way that congestion, congestion is actually created, created in the city based on the way that planning is gone, I'm, I'm against it. Uh, I think that if we look back at how the, the city has been restructured, over the last 20 years, as far as like adding bike lanes where there really shouldn't be, uh, pedestrian plazas that have been creating congestion around the areas, I think if we address those issues first, then we probably won't have to tax uh, the independent, independent people. Congestion pricing. Not such a fan. I actually, I like the pedestrian plazas. I think they're better ways for us to reduce congestion, like pedestrian plazas. And also, I think that we need to be talking about autonomous cars, which we understand. We, we have, beginning we to have started to talk about those yeah. if you've been uh, <laughs> so seeing it, the mayor and like, the governor uh, feud of yeah, late. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Polanco, future. congestion pricing. No, I oppose anything that costs New Yorkers more money. We pay enough money in tolls already. Back to you, Mr. Lane. Uh, a letter grade here. We're going to grade all three of the citywide officials, all Democrats seeking re-election. A letter grade for the mayor. Uh, Z is the lowest I can go, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Balkan. I'd give him a C. 
I give him a D minus just because UPK. Uh huh. UPK keeps and him from an F. An F. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Lane, the current public advocate, Letitia James. What grade would you give her? Yeah, she's she's down there with De Blasio. I'll give her a Z. Okay, Mr. Bowden, <laughs> give her C plus. I give her a D. And Mr. Uh, Stringer, uh, Comptroller Stringer, how would you grade his performance as the city's chief uh, fiscal officer? I'd give him a B. Mr. Mm, I'd, I'd C. And Mr. Blonde. I'd give him an A. The mayoral race coming up, uh, voters might be interested in who you're supporting in that race, if you're, if you're willing to share. Obviously, your ballot is secret at the, at the voting booth, so up to you whether you want to share. But I think uh, it'd be interesting to folks, uh, you all express doubts, obviously, about Mayor de Blasio. Uh, but who, who do you plan to support in the, in the mayoral election, Mr. Lane? Um, I'm supporting my Green Party candidate, Akeem Browder. Mr. I'll, I'll be supporting the Libertarian candidate, uh, Aaron Comey. And I'm supporting Nicole Maliotakis. Okay, very good. Uh, so let's get back to some issues here. Uh, let's, let's start with transit. Uh, obviously, it's been a, a major problem over the summer as we've seen more and more delays, but this has obviously been building for a long time. Weigh in on uh, the city role here. What could the public advocate do? Or more generally speaking, where should things be heading on transit? Do you have ideas about MTA funding, about buses, about bike lanes? Uh, what are your ideas and your thoughts on city transit? We'll start with you, Mr. Blanco. There was an attack on attorneys a little earlier. I just want to represent them. They're great people, and I, and I hope to have the support of attorneys watching today. Okay. Um, the only job mentioned in the Constitution, but let's continue. Um, it's important for us when we look at the MTA, we have to just be honest and say the voters of New York City deserve to have a majority vote on issues affecting New York City at the MTA. So, you know, that's going to involve bill drafting and it's going to involve the change of law, which is why I'm so open to a con con so that we can talk about these issues. But I think that when it comes to New York City transit, the mayor and the citywide officials should have a say um, as to how we're going to divide those funds and how we're going to provide better services. So I will give the majority of the votes on issues affecting New York City Transit on the MTA board to the mayor and the public advocate and the controller and the my plan. We would all have some uh, appointees. Now, in addition, I think we have to continue looking for ferry routes to expand across the Bronx and Brooklyn and Staten Island from the South Shore moving up so that we can get more people on ferries and less people on trains and in buses. And until we realize that the city is overcrowded and that our trains are overcrowded and that our schools are overcrowded and that our roadways are overcrowded, we need to have a real look at working with neighboring county executives on providing better transportation routes so that those New Yorkers that may consider going to Orange, Westchester, Rockland, Nassau, Suffolk would look at other ways that they can get to work and move elsewhere to reduce the amount of people that we currently have in our train system. Thank you. Mr. Lane on transit. Yeah, transit is a mess. <laughs> I've been riding the subway since they were a quarter, I believe. Uh, I'm, I'm showing my age. Uh, and, and I've seen them actually get progressively worse as the years go by. When I first started riding the trains, even our, our normal local trains had timetables at the token booth clerks when we had token booth clerks. Uh, so, and actually they ran on time. But as the years have gone by and communities have been overdeveloped, because that's really what the issue is. We have overdeveloped communities, but the infrastructure to support them haven't been developed. So once again, looking at data, how many people are in this community? What do we need to do? Do we need to create more lines? Do we need to create more bus lines? I mean, I, for my first thing is, as a Green, I would like to see more like electric buses. You know, why do we have more buses that are, are, are indebted to the fossil fuel industry? So I would like to see more electric buses created to help move things along. We'd have to have more bus lanes, obviously, to help speed that route up. But the, the, the transit system is crumbling. Uh, and the, once again, I go back to home rule, that if New York City has so many transit riders and we're spending so much money on, on commuting so many people every day, then we should definitely have a larger say. And Albany shouldn't be interfering with, you know, how much funding we get. I mean, we'll have to create a sustainable solution here in New York City on how to fund that MTA. And, that, and that's some of that uh, constitutional constitutional convention tension there, right? Uh, home rule is one of the things that folks supporting the vote say, but obviously there's, there's risk that, that, that folks opposing say. Uh, Mr. Balkan on transit. I think that there's a general consensus emerging that New York City needs to take control of the MTA. And to do that, we need to build a public movement, a movement amongst the, in the city to, 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 to engage in that type of like big, uh, that type of big move. And so this is where public consultation processes become so important. Because if the public is engaged in a process where they feel like they're getting good information, their voices are being heard, and that what they want can be enacted, then we actually have the opportunity to build movements 
that, that, can, that can make these types of big moves. I also think public consultation is a really important piece of kind of the, the, the more local transit planning that isn't taking place right now. But you know, when we talk about transit, we have to remember that over the next four years, over the next eight years, we're going to see autonomous vehicles emerge. And autonomous vehicles are not uh, just simply cars that drive themselves. They create a whole new set of opportunities and a whole new set of risks that come with, uh, that, that, that come with this power. What's one opportunity? I mean, opportunity, you know, we think about uh, an autonomous car as like my car, but it drives itself. But really, they're, they're, they have designs where cars become, cars can link together and become buses, where you can get these types of trams uh, tram routes that were that that can kind of create themselves depending on demand at different times, uh, and so there's a tremendous amount of new transit options that are taking place. But right now, because we don't have good public consultation processes, because we have individual politicians kind of making decisions in a vacuum, we don't have the t the ability to build public consensus around how we're going to leverage these really really powerful technologies that are emerging. We'll start back with you, Mr. Balkan, on this. Uh, what's the public advocate's role here? What's the city not doing right? Do you have proposals as to how we can reduce the homelessness population in, in New Absolutely. York City? Absolutely, and you know, going back to the public advocate's role as an information manager, um, right now New York City is one of, own, of, of, of only a few cities in the country uh, that does not have a 211 system. A lot of people think that it, you know, we have a 311 system, they don't know what a 211 system is. If you ask any social worker in Connecticut uh, or in Long Island or New Jersey, uh, about a two-on-one system, they'll tell you it is the foundation of, non of how nonprofits provide services to people in need. And what a two-on-one system is, is it's a directory that's centrally managed that organizes all the information about what nonprofit services are available and how people can access those services, what, what criteria they need to access those services. So we haven't done the most basic function of just figuring out how people can get services in the city who need those services. And once, and that's an inexpensive thing to do. It's an information management role that's perfect for the public advocate to do. And once we do that, we can start building, a, we, we can actually see what the safety net is. Because right now, we don't even know what the safety net is. And once we can see the safety net, we can start filling in the gaps that we understand exist within that safety net. So I think that the homelessness question I mean, it's such an important question, but until we do the basics, it's hard to start saying, oh, we need to spend all this money with these huge plans. It's like, we need a directory of services so people can find what they're entitled to. Thank you. Mr. Polanco. Well, you know, it's an important question because I oppose the mayor's plan to open up 93 uh, shelters across the city. I think uh, this is the wrong idea, considering that neighborhoods don't want those shelters there for a whole host of reasons, from affecting their quality of life to changing the fabric of their neighborhood and not knowing who these people are that are coming in. Unfortunately, a lot of the people that are uh, in, this, in that situation, not, not the majority by no means, but many, have severe mental illnesses. I've proposed a plan to how we can best address the issues of the severely mentally ill by providing more money to our psychiatric hospitals to have more beds and more medicine and more doctors available to care for them and speed up the process for Kendra's Law to we, so we can find out who's really, who, which one of these individuals poses a risk uh, to the city. That's one way we can reduce the number of people that are homeless by bringing them into the hospitals when they need care so they, we could protect them from hurting themselves and other people. And Kendra's now, Law briefly is, is sort of forcing folks uh, in severe mental illness to get treatment. Medication, mm -hmm. yeah, treatment and medication. Uh, so I, I think it's important for us to expand how we're able to get Kendra's Law applied to many of the folks that are out there and unfortunately are homeless today. Then we have another issue to deal with. We have to deal with substance abuse issues, um, and deal with them through the Thrive New York City program. And that's when that comes into play, how we can help people get off of alcohol and drugs. But until we do that, we're not going to be able to help these people get jobs. They need training. They need support so they can get themselves back on their feet. Many of these folks have been there for a long time, and they don't have skill sets that are uh, marketable in today's economy. So why not help them get those skill sets so that they can get those jobs? Finally, I think it's very important for us to look at what housing is available currently across the city where these individuals that are not severely mentally ill, that don't suffer from uh, substance abuse, are able to move to in the short term so that they can get back on their feet. But opening up these shelters against the will of the neighborhoods across the city, I think is the wrong idea. And furthermore, it leads to more segregation and where are these places going to be put? I doubt highly that they're going to be placed in Park Avenue, Park Slope, and other more affluent neighborhoods Just across the city. Just briefly on that, the mayor says we're going to open up 90 new shelters across the city, but it gets us out of commercial hotels and some of these cluster site apartments that have had major problems. So how do you end the use of commercial hotels, end the use of these terrible cluster sites, but not open up new shelters? 
Well, you know, it's important that I work with the controller's office to find out if that fund funding is available. One of the things is public advocate, you're not responsible for the money. So when the questions of finances come up, uh, it's very difficult for us to know where we're going to cut. I, I know this. Those hotels are very expensive, and they make very little sense to continue using them. But unfortunately, what we're looking at is that we're depending on these hotels. The creation of a new shelter in neighborhoods that don't want them is going to cost billions of dollars and is going to make developers very rich at the expense of neighborhoods that don't want them. There has to be another alternative, Ben. It's not going to be the, we're either going to put these people in hotels or we're going to open up expensive shelters. There has to be existing residences that are available now for those individuals that don't pose a risk to themselves or to the people that they will be living with. Thank you. Mr. Lane. Yeah, and so, like we are talking about before, yes, the public definitely needs a resource, like two-on-one, perfect. You know, because I, I my, my sister, like when I told you before that I was adopted, I found out I had this other family. One of my family members was my half-sister, and when I first met her, she was in a homeless shelter. And it's not because she had some kind of mental illness or she didn't want to work. She was working, supporting her two kids, and going to school. And she's part of this community of people that are homeless because there is no affordable housing in the city. So the first thing, like I said before, we need a moratorium on this, these luxury rentals that are going up on all these communities that people don't even want. People can't live there. And, and the whole joke of the matter is people look, it's like, oh, our neighborhood's being gentrified. Even the so-called interlopers that are gentrifying the neighborhoods, they're not rich, not rolling in dough. There's like they're living three to five in an apartment in one of those high you know, price apartments. So we really need to address affordable housing. I mean, before we even talk about homelessness, we got to talk about why is, is this real estate market so escalated in this city when there's so many people that are living under a $30,000 a year annual income? You know, unless so we how bring... how is housing created for those folks? How do, you, how do you create housing for people making under 30, even 40,000 or, or a little bit more? How do you create that housing? Right. Well, that housing exists. That housing exists right now because, <laughs> honestly, there are a lot of units that have been built that nobody can move into, and they're just derelict. So the city should work out with those landlords and say, look, you know, we have X number of people, you know, have a process in place. You could actually evaluate the families and say, have them move in and sort of make up the difference, subsidize the rent difference for that place. So people can actually live in a... In a halfway decent apartment because <laughs> you know even the new quality housing that's been put up are actually just riddled with bad construction and they're not following any good standards but at least they can move into an apartment they can sort of get back on their feet and they don't have to feel this crushing burden of having to work two or three jobs to stay in an apartment thank you so we're in our last topic or two before closing statements we're going to start with mr polanco here uh education there's a there's a few different things that are sort of uh the key key issues around education. We mentioned overcrowding before. Uh, there's also the question of desegregating our city schools. Uh, part of that discussion is often whether you embrace charter schools or not. And then there's the question around what do you do about some of these chronically underperforming schools, uh, schools that have really been struggling for a long time. The, this mayor has had a very different approach from his predecessor, uh, but we don't exactly see that that's revolutionizing the success at these at these schools uh, rather than closing them down. So on education, what are some of the things that you want to tackle that you would focus on, Mr. Polanco? You know, as an educator for almost two decades, I'm keenly aware of the issues affecting our parents across the city. My son goes to public school. My daughter goes to parochial school. And when you look at the city, you have 48,000 kids waiting for a charter school spot. Um, I'm going to fight very hard to make sure that those kids have a shot at the American dream and to have a, a fair shot at success by making sure they have the charter school that they want to go to. And I'm not going to stop there. I will work very hard to expand choice for parents of where they're going to send their kids to school. I strongly believe that your kid's success shouldn't depend on their zip code or a lottery number for a charter school. So we should expand all options for parents. I definitely think that we should look at the things that work in charter schools and expand them to zone public schools. I think Success Academy has been very successful uh, at seeing kids that look like me, that come from the places that I did, poor like me, and are able to succeed in incredible numbers, 112% in math or in the state exams, over 68% are succeeding uh, in English exams where other kids in zone schools are not succeeding. What are they doing in charter schools that we could incorporate in public schools? And to your question on desegregation, um, Controller Stringer discovered that there were 1,100 sites across the city that were city-owned, and there are empty lots. Uh, at the end of the day, after a bunch of uh, 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 rumblings between both the controller and the mayor, they say that over, over only 200 are available because those lots are not able to be used, they're not habitable, etc. I suggest we take 10 of those and make mosaic charter schools. 
These charter schools would be two for every borough that would encourage parents to in incentivize parents to want to send their kids there from different parts of the city. I think that we can create an environment of integration by encouraging and incentivizing parents to uh, participate in mosaic schools where the theme of each school is going to be to learn about different histories and different cultures. I'm going to have to and, stop you there. It's and an I think that's interesting important, idea. Ben. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lane, to you on education. So I have issues with charter schools. One of my biggest issues is that um, charter schools take resources away from public schools. They take their space. They don't pay for that space that they're taking. And, and they're being judged against public schools that the reason why their students are, are doing as well is because they've been sucked of resources. You know, they're not getting books they need. They, you know, they're being held to standards, to having class sizes that are larger than they should be for an adequate learning uh, experience. Uh, my, I'm lucky enough that my son is in a public school that actually has an alternative view on education. And so they try to keep class sizes below 25 students if they can. Um, but, but the downfall of that is they don't get the funding from the city. So it's up to the parents to make up the difference. As a Green Party candidate, we've always believed in free education from pre-K up to, to higher education. A lot of our elected officials now have benefited off of going to school with free education. So. The, the discussion of uh, for charter, you know, for profit charter schools, you know, like what Eva Moskowitz runs with the Success Academy, it just infuriates me when we have so many other schools that are, are facing closure. Because if you close on a public school in a certain community, where do those students go? They have to go and crowd some other public school because they're not going to get into Success Academy. And in fact, Success Academy has, has the, the option to kick out students that they feel won't excel and when they do their their uh, standardized tests i'm gonna have to leave it there i understand we have a very strong difference of opinion on success academy and charters we're not gonna be able to hash all that out today <laughs> so i encourage viewers to do all the reading there's lots of coverage of success academy and to look at pros and cons and all, all the debate so we won't go back and forth on that now uh, but we'll come to mr balkind on education and then we'll go to closing statements this is a tremendous challenge uh, because you know New York City's public school system is so big, and what we have to I think what we have to acknowledge is that you know we're, the public school system is getting I believe over twenty thousand per uh, and twenty thousand dollars per student, and so we should be able to get a really good education for every student for every student in New York with twenty thousand dollars per pupil, and we and we have to use that information uh, to hold the Department of Education accountable. And we need to basically go through a process of bureaucratic reformation within the Department of Education so that we can make our public school system as strong as it can be. You know, over the last 10, 20 years, we've seen how the Internet is transforming how people get knowledge, get information. We're seeing massive innovation taking place throughout the world in terms of bringing the price of education down and bringing the, the, the quality of education up because we're use, they're, they're, they're using curriculums that are developed globally, that uh, they're using technologies to, to reduce costs. There's so many good opportunities for innovation here. And so what we need to do is we need to create a situation where A, uh, school performance is extremely transparent. You know, just going back to what the role of the public advocate is, an information manager. School performance is transparent. Every school should have a website. Every school should have a newspaper, you know, should have a blog where people and parents can understand and interact with the school administrators. They can, it's an opportunity for kids to get involved in the next generation of online publishing by like getting involved in this. And we need to go through a process of bureaucratic reformation where we're using open source approaches. We're going into the Department of Education. We're skilling up people, bureaucrats within that system to use tools better so they can reduce costs and improve services. It's the only way. The open source methodology is the only methodology that's going to allow us to reform these bureaucracies. Thank you. And uh, before we move to closing statements, I'll say I'm, I'm as a journalist, I'm all for students uh, publishing more and, and, and taking that uh, task on. So we'll move to closing statements here. A uh, couple weeks before Election Day, make your pitch to voters across the city and especially here in Manhattan about why you should be the next public advocate. We're going to start with Mr. Polanco and, and move to my right. Well, thank you. I hope you had an opportunity to get an idea of our backgrounds and what we want to do as public advocate here in New York City. Um, you can visit my website at polancofornyc.com. There you're going to get a lot more information as to what my platform is. I prepare relentlessly to ask for your support. When I'm public advocate, if you so kindly vote for me, we're going to change the way things are done. We're going to end pay to play. We're going to expand school choice so that you can send your kids to a school that's going to be able to give your child the best opportunity at success. We're going to fight against any plan that's going to close Rikers and replace them with neighborhood jails. And I want to make sure that every kid has a fair shot. As your public advocate, we're going to work to end pay to play. 
want to make sure that you know that your government is working on your behalf and is working honestly. But I need your support. So please come out and vote for me. And lastly, if you're a Democrat watching this and you feel your party has moved too far to the left, I'm your guy. If, you th if you're an independent or blank voter, didn't register anywhere, I'm the only one calling for an opportunity for you to have a say in your next year's elections. So give me a chance. And if you're a practical Republican like me, come home and vote down the line. And I, I hope you vote for me this November. Thank you. Mr. Balkan. Thanks. I want to be a public advocate that's non, a nonpartisan watchdog. And I want to build tools that allow you, the public, to understand how the government works. And one of the commitments that I make to you is that I will give you results, not rhetoric. And I've already shown that with my campaign. If you go to votedevin.com slash tools, you'll see that we've built a project, capital budgets project directory that, puts, that creates a project for every single page in the capital budget process. That's over $10 billion documented better than it's ever been documented before. We've built a, a, a tool uh, to organize services, government services and nonprofit services, so people understand what services, what human health services they can access from the government they can, they can, and, and, and they can get the services that they need. We've built a tool to, to view the laws and the, and the administrative code of the city so it's actually searchable and easy to find information about what are the laws and rules governing uh, the place that we live. And, so, and we've also built New York Speaks, which is the public consultation process that I keep talking about that allows New Yorkers to, to do a few swipes, to, do, to, to basically do a little bit of uh, polling, and then it puts them with people who think like them, and then they can make proposals that then we bring to the public, we bring to the public forum so that they can, uh, so that the public can, can see what the public wants, and we can actually uh, put the public advocate in the hands of the public, which is what I think the, the position's always done. So vote, if you want to see the open source revolution take place in the city, if you want to see uh, significant reform of government bureaucracies using open source methodologies, please vote for Devin Balkind on the Libertarian Party line. Thank November. you. And Mr. Lane. So my name is James Lane. I'm the Green Party candidate for public advocate. And I'd like to thank Ben, Manhattan Neighborhood Networks, League of Women Voters, all the sponsors that put this televised debate together because this is the kind of forum that we're looking for, and I think it's really unconscionable that the current public advocate isn't here right now. Uh, she's allowed to raise $900,000 in, in her own you know, public, uh, private fundraising, and yet get $700 additional thousand dollars, right? $700,000 additionally through public uh, campaign finance board, and she's not here right now. And so it's just, it's, it blows me away that that's allowed. So you know, my main, main three things that I wanna do is change our electoral process in the city. You know, I want to get rid of uh, the primary elections and actually move everything towards a ranked choice voting in a general election. So that way you have more choices, more voices. People could rank their choices, have more time to learn about their candidates. Uh, I want to remove the money from politics that we're seeing right now because the fact that we had a televised debate this Monday night and, you know, it's really just dependent on the campaign finance board is directing who's allowed to be in that debate is an issue for me. Uh, Tish James was so gracious to say, well, I can't go through another election not having any general election debates uh, that she let JC. And so that was amazing. But it would have been better if she allowed the other candidates to be in. It's not that many candidates running. So I hope that if there is another opportunity for a televised debate on New York One, that she does that. Uh, the other thing that I would like to do is, once I said, um, have a moratorium on these high-rise rentals uh, that are being constructed. We need to have more affordable housing. S switch from this 80-20, that's not being really represented, it's not being fairly uh, constructed because when you're, you're looking at the 20% affordable housing it and basing it on people that are making $100,000 a year, it's not affordable. It needs to be dropped down to 30,000. And until we get to that point, we need to change it to 50-50. And you know, my final thing that I didn't really get to talk about today was having community control over policing. Because I get it, you know, people like law enforcement, but we have to have a way to monitor who is who are the people walking around with lethal force around our neighborhoods? If we really want to talk about safe cities, you know, we have a case right now where two undercover officers kidnapped a teenage woman, brought her into her van, raped her, and they're up for trial right now. We should not have element like that on our NYPD. And as public advocate, I would strongly enforce community control over policing and investigative uh, power over that agency. Thank you. I want to thank the candidates for participating in today's debate. The general election will be held on Tuesday, November 7th. For more information about voting, locating your poll site, and all the candidates, you can visit the League of Women Voters website at lwvnyc.org, gothamgazette.com, or mnn.org. Thank you for watching Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.